headlines. South Korean President Park Geun-hye holds a rare sit-down with the visiting governor of Tokyo, bearing a message from Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, vowing to improve strained ties between Seoul and Tokyo. The two-day early voting period for the July 30th by-elections begins today with 15 parliamentary seats on the line. And the wreckage of Air Algeria Flight 5017 has been found in Mali, while the French president says the plane's black box has been recovered. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Primetime News, live from Seoul in Kang City. And I'm Sean Lim. And what a way to end the week. We have the latest developments in the capture of the eldest son of the fugitive ferry owner. But first, let's begin with high-level discussions between President Park and the visiting governor of Tokyo. President Park sat down for the rare meeting to hear him out, but did not hesitate to emphasize that Japan's distorted view of history was holding relations back. The governor also had a message from her counterpart, Shinzo Abe, that expressed an intent to improve strained ties between Seoul and Tokyo, but sincerity remains in question. Choi Yusan starts us off. In a rare meeting with a Japanese politician on Friday, President Park emphasized that without a correct understanding of history, Korea and Japan will not be able to build a trust-based relationship. During talks with Tokyo Governor Yoichi Masuzoe, the president referred to a nation's territory as its body and its history as its soul. She said that harming a country's soul shakes the foundation of that nation. She also said that cooperation between the two neighboring countries was essential for peace and stability in Northeast Asia and that politics shouldn't get in the way of bilateral relations. The Korean leader's remarks came after Masuzo Wei delivered a message from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who said he intends to work towards mending ties with Seoul. Bilateral ties have soured over Japan's repeated whitewashing of its colonial-era atrocities and claims to Korea-controlled Tokdo Island. President Buck then cast light on the unsettled issue surrounding Korean women forced into sex slavery by the Japanese military during World War II. <laughs> 군대 위안부 문제 같은 것은 뭐두 나라 사이의 문제뿐만 아니라 또 보편적인 그 여성 인권에 관한 문제이기도 하기 때문에 좀 어떤 진정성 있는 노력으로 잘 풀려 나가기를 기대하고 있습니다. The Korean president also asked the Tokyo governor to ensure the safety of Koreans and their businesses in Japan in the wake of anti-Korea protests carried out by some interest groups. Friday's talks between President Buck and Masuzoe are considered to have reflected both Seoul and Tokyo's willingness to engage. But so long as the Abe administration continues to deny Japan's past wrongdoings, an improvement in ties seems far off. Choi <laughs> Yusun, Arirang News. Now, regarding one of the many issues that have strained the Seoul-Tokyo ties, a U.N. panel has urged Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime system of sexual slavery. Park ji tells us more. Two victims of Japan's wartime system of sexual slavery visited the city of Glendale in California this week. It's where a monument dedicated to them and the thousands of other victims, a bronze statue of a young girl dressed in traditional Korean clothing, is set up. Please help us, the victims, receive an apology before we all die. Lee ok says she was abducted by Japanese soldiers when she was only 15 and sent to a military brothel. To this day, the Japanese government denies its military operated the brothels, despite a huge amount of evidence that shows the military did. The two women, now in their late 80s, spoke out against some Japanese Americans and Japanese officials who want the statue removed. They are saying really inhumane things. Both women will stay in the U.S. for another couple of weeks. 
They will travel to Virginia and New Jersey and to other monuments set up in memory of all those who suffered under Japan's cruel system of sexual slavery. Meanwhile, a UN panel is urging Japan to provide a public apology and compensation to the victims of its wartime sex slave victims before it's too late. The UN Human Rights Committee said Thursday, after reviewing the records of several countries, it's concerned about the re-victimization of the former sex slavery victims. The panel criticized the Japanese government for continuously denying its responsibility and even defaming the victims, rather than taking the necessary steps to help them. The committee, made up of 18 independent experts, also noted that every compensation claim brought by victims has been dismissed and every call to ask for independent investigation on the sex slavery has been rejected in Japan. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. The eldest son of Korea's most wanted man, Yoo Byung-un, was arrested this Friday evening. Yoo and his son, Taegyun, had been evading authorities over the past two months as the family's corrupt business was believed to be the key factor that led to the April ferry disaster. Authorities had been offering a bounty of more than 97,000 U.S. dollars for the son's capture. And regarding the body of his father, Yoo Byung-un, that was found last month, the state forensic service says it's failed to figure out the cause of death because the body was severely decomposed. But it did refute conspiracy theories, so suggesting the death of you was so faked, saying DNA samples, a fingerprint sample, dental records, and height all matched that of the 73-year-old you. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang Sean Lim and Kang Chedi from the heart of Seoul. News begins now. Primetime News, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Korean voters don't have to wait until Election Day to cast ballots in the nation's largest ever by-elections on July 30th. A two-day early voting period started today, opening a race that has greater significance coming off local elections in June, where no party could claim victory. Our Connie Kim reports. Two days of early voting for the July 30th by-elections has begun. Those that cast ballots today and tomorrow will help determine the winners in Korea's largest ever by-elections, where 15 parliamentary seats are up for grabs. Six of the vacant seats are in Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province, and analysts say winning the upper hand in those races may very well determine who won the election overall. Three opposition candidates bowed out of their respective races on Thursday to circle the wagons around the liberal candidate. In Seoul's Dongjeokbi constituency, considered a barometer of public sentiment in the capital, the ruling party candidate is in the lead. According to the last opinion poll results released Wednesday, the ruling Henry Party candidate Na Gyeong Won is in the lead by some 10 percentage points against her Justice Party rival Do Hye Chan. Another district closely being watched is the Suwon Si district in Gyeonggi-do province, where the ruling party's Kim Yong Nam is in a heated race with former opposition leader Son Hak Kyu. Son had a slight lead of around three percentage points as of Wednesday. With just a few days to go before the by-elections, the ruling party lashed out at the opposition parties for unifying candidacies. The main opposition party also stepped up criticism of the ruling party, blaming it for delaying the passage of the special bill on April's ferry tragedy. The government's failed manhunt for the fugitive owner of the Seoro ferry, Yu byung -un, has also been a focal point of the opposition's campaign. Despite the contentious issues, analysts don't expect a clear winner to emerge in these by-elections, much like in local elections in June. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Summer sales may abound in Korea these days, but shoppers aren't bringing as much heat. Korea's July Consumer Sentiment Index dropped and went right back to where it was after the April ferry disaster. Our Hwang Jie has the details. This department store located in the heart of the capital's hoes seems to be bustling with people as usual. But a sales clerk says that's only because it's the weekend. 
I feel like the number of customers dropped recently, and most of our customers during weekdays are tourists, not locals. Reflecting that, the Bank of Korea said Friday the nation's consumer sentiment index stood at 105 in July, down two points from a month earlier. The figure had rebounded in June, suggesting that Korean consumers might be returning to their spending habits, which changed after April's ferry tragedy. The index hovered at around the 108 level in the first four months of this year, but dropped to 105 in May following the disaster. The figure returned to that level this month, and experts say that reflects the nation's still sluggish domestic demand. Although the index did improve in June, the numbers show that the economy's overall domestic demand is not recovering to the pre-April disaster level. Experts add that this month's consumer sentiment was also affected by the central bank's recent cut of its growth forecast for this year. The monthly index is a gauge of the overall economic outlook of consumers, their living conditions and future spending plans. A reading over 100 means optimists outnumber pessimists. A recent poll by Nielsen also showed that Korea's consumer sentiment is near the bottom among 60 countries worldwide. And the figures indicate a bumpy road ahead for President Park and his new economic team and their attempts to pull the economy out of a low growth rut by boosting domestic demand. Hong Jie, Arirang News. Well, with expectations of slow demand and growth to continue, speculation is growing that the central bank may lower interest rates at its next policy meeting for the first time in more than a year. Our Kim ji reports on the mounting pressure. There's growing speculation the Bank of Korea will cut its interest rate in the latter half of this year, perhaps as early as next month. The government is reportedly pressuring the central bank to lower the rate, which has been kept at 2.5 percent for 14 straight months, in order to boost its expansionary fiscal and monetary policies. The nation's new economic team, led by Finance Minister Che Kyung Han, announced on Thursday a $40 billion stimulus plan to spur growth by inducing spending and promoting corporate activity. The government request for a rate cut comes partly because it's too late to increase the supplementary budget, which could have been used to raise capital for the stimulus plan. The speculation of a rate cut is also being fueled by recent economic figures. The central bank announced Thursday that the economic growth rate in the second quarter inched up by a mere 0.6 percent from the previous quarter, lower than previous estimates. Those that support a rate cut say the move will induce domestic consumption, which was attributed as the main reason for the lack of growth from April to June. The plan is to reduce the amount of debt repayments, thus increasing the spending power of households. But some experts say cutting the interest rate is a double-edged sword that would actually increase household debt in the longer term and ultimately constrain domestic demand, since the policy would open the door for households to spend more despite their growing debt. Household debt will continue to rise even if the interest rate isn't lowered. It's something we have to work on in the long term. However, what's more important is what we're facing now, and that is to bring about economic recovery, possibly by lowering the interest rate. If the economy gets better, then domestic consumption will rise as household debt repayment improves. The Bank of Korea's next rate-setting meeting is scheduled for August 14th. Kim Jong, Arirang News. For our viewers around the world, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think about Korea? According to a recent survey conducted on 6,000 people from 17 different countries upon the request of Korea's foreign ministry, the most common response was technology. Samsung was next on the list, followed by war and a size a hit song, Gangnam Style. Perhaps most surprising, though, more than 30 percent of those surveyed said they found it hard to differentiate between South and North Korea. Korea. Meanwhile, more than half of those who answered the survey said they would like to see Korea act as a bridge between advanced and developing economies throughout the world. Now let's get a recap of this week's domestic headlines. Our Yudian joins us. 
Good evening and happy Friday. Let's first take a look at Joseon Ilbo, which did a series uh, covering some of the challenges Korea needs to tackle to boost the sluggish economy. First, taking a look at this article, which centers around how conglomerates have simply been turning their heads away from the problem. Now, taking a closer look at the graph over here, uh, it shows the amount of capital investment in Korea by conglomerate has fallen over the past two years. Now, also companies like Samsung Electronics. Electronics has been drastically expanding its employment overseas rather than in Korea in the past three years, as evident by the lighter, lighter colored figure. Now, Hyundai Motor also a similar story with a rise in the employment of foreigners. Now, while doing so, the article indicates that the country's top 10 conglomerates were able to cut down their debt ratio by 10 percentage points from 2009 to 2013. Now, continuing on with the series, uh, the paper cites foreign experts who say the low dividend payments of Korean companies as are a major weakness for the domestic economy. Now, dividend payments uh, represent just 1% of the company's share price in Korea. That's the lowest among G20 countries, as can be seen here in the bar graph. Now, the chairman of Rogers Holdings says global investors undervalue Korean stocks because of the low dividend payments and investment guru Mark Faber says at this rate, uh, the Korean stock market could soon only draw in domestic investors. Now, moving on over to Chungang Ilbo. And taking a look at the story here, it talks about how North Korea China relations have sunk to a new low. Now, in the bullet points here, the paper talks about how China did not export oil to its tradi traditional ally for six straight months. Now, that's shocking given that about 80% of North Korea's oil came from China. Also, high level talks haven't been held for a year now, and China also lent support to a UN resolution against Pyongyang's recent missile launches. Now, the paper says the strained relations are the result of Chinese President Xi Jinping's global diplomacy. She has been placing much importance on the responsibility China now holds in the international community. And the United States acknowledged this during high-level talks earlier this month, the paper says, uh, when State Department spokesperson Jen Psaki pointed out that China has beefed up its sanctions against North Korea. Now, finally, moving on over to May Business and taking a look at the story here. It talks about how Korea's popular bakery shop, a Paris Baguette, is opening a store in Paris. Fun enough, funny enough, 26 years ago, Paris Baguette was first established as a way to bring French bakery skills here to Korea. Now, after growing into one of Korea's largest food manufacturers, the new store here is seen here in the photo uh, near the Louvre Museum in Paris. Paris is now aiming to woo French customers. Sitting amid thousands of restaurants that have for decades catered to the refined palate of the French, Paris Baguette's 26 years old of success will truly be put to test. Now with that, I'll wrap up this week's look at some of the eye-catching stories from the Korean papers. Authorities have tracked down the wreckage of the Algerian passenger plane that crashed in southern Mali, claiming the lives of all 116 people on board. With more, we now turn to Paul Yi at the News Center. Paul, this comes following a string of recent international aviation accidents. We had the downing of the Malaysian airliner, the plane crashed in Taiwan, and the close call at an Israeli airport. Do we know what caused the crash in Mali? Well, Tom, civil aviation experts are investigating the crash, with France taking the lead as more than 50 of its citizens were on board. Officials say poor weather was mostly likely to blame, but they haven't ruled out terrorism. And according to President Francois Hollande, a black box has been recovered from the wreckage of the Air Algeria jet. Our Connie Lee reports. A plane that went missing early Thursday has been found. The wreckage of Air Algeria Flight 5017 has been spotted in Mali, according to officials. The team has confirmed it has seen the remains of the plane, totally burned out and scattered on the ground. Sadly, the team saw no one on site. It saw no survivors. It is possible that some parts of the aircraft were seen by locals in dune areas. 
near the village of Bosi in Mali. All this information will be confirmed after inquiries. It was supposed to be a four-hour overnight flight from Wagodagu to Algiers, Algeria. But the flight, carrying 116 people on board, including French and Spanish nationals, lost radar contact just 50 minutes after takeoff, and now found crashed in Mali. Bad weather is being suspected as a cause. The flight had asked to change its route before losing contact because of a storm. The Air Algeri crash is the third plane disaster in a week. Malaysia Airlines Flight 17 was brought down by a surface-to-air missile in Ukraine one week ago. And Taiwan's TransAsia Flight 222 crashed amid inclement weather on Wednesday. The death toll from all three crashes exceeds 400. Connie Lee, Adirang News. The operator of the popular instant messaging service Line is making waves in the Japanese market as it prepares to file one of the hottest IPOs this year. After months of speculation, the Korean internet search giant Naver, which owns Line, announced last week that it filed for an initial public offering in Tokyo and said it could also take the messaging firm public on the New York Stock Exchange. However, some analysts are warning that investors should be wary of the hype. Line could hit an extremely high debut price and has a great chance of ballooning. People would want to buy Line shares not only because of the company's rapid growth, but they're also bullish on its global business as its global users are exceeding the number of users in Japan. Naver said it would release more details of its potential IPO next month, but at the very least, it's showing that the U.S. isn't the only home for the new generation of tech giants. And finally, the online retail giant Amazon has posted its latest earnings report with a net loss of 128 million U.S. dollars for the second quarter this year. That's more than double what the company projected, with those losses expected to hit up to 800 million dollars by next quarter. Revenues, though, jumped 23 percent on year to 19.3 billion dollars. I think that their biggest competition at this point is a lot of the traditional retailers that have finally managed to uh, really improve their operations and are gaining more share back. And an ex ex some of the examples of that are companies like Walmart or Macy's. And I think that that is really where Amazon's bigger competition is. Analysts say Amazon is bleeding money due to rising operating costs from its free shipping services and heavy investment into projects, including its new Fire smartphone. And that wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here next week. Hello and welcome to sports. Well, let's kick things off with the K-League All-Star Game. Taking place in the capital at Seoul World Cup Stadium, the K-League All-Stars took the pitch against Team Park ji -sung. Now, with the recently retired Park ji -sung and also Lee Yong-pyo playing and manager Gus Hiddink on the sidelines, the K-Leaguers had to bring their A-game. But it's Park's day. His team goes up 3-0 before the K-League makes it 3-2 at halftime. Well, the goal celebrations are plentiful and also very creative as Captain Bach gets in on the scoring as well. He gives the goodbye salute before his marriage on Sunday, but in the end, it's a draw. Final score, 6-6. Six to six. And moving on to baseball, rain hit the fields during the play, so two games were canceled on this day, but two games were on. In the first, Hanwha beats Kia 8-3. Now, let's get to the NC Dinos and Samsung Lions. We go to the first inning, Samsung scores two, started by Park Suk Min's sack fly. Then we go to the third, NC answers back. Na Sung Bum slams a two-run shot, and it's only tied briefly, as in the bottom third, Navarro scores for Samsung. But fifth inning, more of the same. Che tae hits for a two-run double. It's eventually 6-2 Lions. But NC comes back in the sixth inning. Park Minu he hits a three-run home run, and it's all tied up. But Samsung breaks the deadlock in the seventh inning, and they go on to win this one, 10 to six. Now let's get to the Ansan Uri Card Pro Volleyball Cup. The first semifinal matchups were held on Friday, starting with the women. 
It was Korea Expressway up against Hyundai ENC, and they go the distance. But Hyundai ENC dominate the final set, and they win 3-2. Now for the men rivals, Samsung Hwaje and Korean Air went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and it also goes to the fifth set there. Korean Air gets the edge and holds on to win this one 3-2. Well, that wraps up for now. This has been Stephen Che. I'll see you back here later with more from the world of sports. Happy Friday, everyone. I'm Kim bo -kyung with your weather update. So far, today has been a mixed bag of conditions. A strong wind watch has been issued for Gyeonggi-do and both Jeollado provinces, while a heat wave warning remained for some areas down south. At the moment, on and off showers are being experienced in the central regions and this rainfall will gradually clear up by Saturday evening. But before then, we're looking at up to 40 millimeters of precipitation in most regions, while 20 to 60 is forecast for Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province. The rain has slightly cooled down the mercury here in the central regions, but down south is still sweltering hot and areas there may be in for some tropical nights over the next few days. On to Saturday's ratings. Seoul hits 27 while Daegu soars to a hot 34. As for other places, Teju jumps to 33 while Tokyo makes it to 27. Have a wonderful Friday evening, stay cool, and I'll see you again after midnight. Thanks, Bo Young, and uh, thank you for watching the program tonight. I'm Kang Tiri. And I'm Sean Lim. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.